Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning, especially on a, a brisk, cold day. I was thinking about it as I was driving in and walking outside and noticing that it was certainly cold and a little bit slippery out, and I thought to myself, well, this is global dewarming that we're going through. And so, and it's supposed to be, I think by next uh, Sunday morning, it's supposed to be like, I think, six degrees or one degrees or something like that. And so it's going to be cooling off for us just a little bit. We'll uh, finally winter has got here, I think. But anyway, can you believe it that we're already in the midst of seven days of the new year? I mean, it seems like it's going, I mean, already it seems like it's just beginning to fly back. And yet a lot of things already have started great with the new year, with Lauren Miller being uh, baptized in, into Christ and putting him on. What a great year for her to begin with. And then, of course, as a congregation, we're already in the midst of starting to ramp up the various activities that are going to be coming our way. And so as you think about 2024, with 23, 23 being in the foreground and now are in the background, and then 2024 right ahead of us, there's some things that are going to be happening. <clears throat> let, me, <clears throat> excuse me, let me remind you that this evening we have a, we're going to be practicing or learning a new song, and so that's going to start at 5 o'clock, and then I'll have a short uh, uh, thought at the end of it, but let me encourage you to be here for that as we learn this a new song. And then let me uh, announce to you that we're going to be having a day of dreaming for our congregation on January the 20th. That begins at 8.30 a.m. in the morning and goes to uh, 10.30. And so from 8.30 to 9, we'll have a continental breakfast and just kind of just get together with one another and share with one another and have a, a nice little meal. And then we'll begin talking about the various ways that we can dream about what we can do as a congregation. And you're allowed to dream and, and think about whatever you want. You can throw whatever you want on the wall. We're going to be talking about uh, dreaming about education and about evangelism, about service, about fellowship, about worship. We maybe talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the, the uh, future idea of a, a new building. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, and we really want you to come and share some of your dreams that you have. And our promise is to you is that we'll consider all of them. And we might do some of them, we may not do any of them, but at least we're going to consider all the dreams that you might have so that we might be able to move forward. And as one person said, dreaming, after all, is a form of planning. So let me encourage you to set aside that time to come and share with us your thoughts about how we might dream. I was thinking about, for instance, our building program, and, and we've been telling you that you know, some of the reason why it goes, seems to go so slow like a snail is that just certain things that the city uh, makes us put into place. And one of those areas for our property is platting the land, just trying to figure out how, where we're going to put the building and where there would be other properties that we might could possibly sell later on down the line, but having to plat it and then to put sewer to it. Here's one thing that you can do to help us move that process a, a little bit uh, faster, and that is be praying for that. Start praying for our building that God would open doors and that he would smooth pathways and that he had knocked down obstacles and barriers that would get in our way. That would go a long way towards seeing that dream one day become a, a real thing. So let me encourage you in, in, in that. The other thing is that I just want you to know that this, this year is a new you. And with a new you comes a, a new year. And I hope that during this year that we can make a resolution where we are right uh, now is that we're going to resolve that we're going to be uh, more determined and they're willing we're going to be willing to sacrifice and put forth whatever effort it is that we might be able to come closer to Jesus Christ and know who he is and what he is about but not just that but that we might align ourselves with his mission because Jesus mission is to be our mission and that's why we have as our theme this year soul to soul making every effort to reach out to one soul at a, a time and so let us be thinking about that, and let us start really, really getting our minds thinking about souls on a regular basis so that we might take opportunity when those opportunities are presented to us. So here we are in, in 2020, or here we were back in 2023, and as you think of 2023, um, as you think back on it, what kind of year was it for you? Was it one of those years that you know that you, you cherished, or is it one that you're ready to just forget, just to put behind you? Well, I found myself on both sides of, of that fence. But nonetheless, whatever the year's tone is, the new year is always filled with hope. You get a, start, a fresh start, fresh, you know, new days that are before us. With the hope of a new year comes a chance for us to make some changes in our, our own lives. It's a chance for a, a new start. It's a chance for a fresh beginning. And with that, oftentimes we make resolutions. 
We ourselves make resolution, even the things that concern ourselves, or maybe even, even God, and how we want this year to be a different year than maybe the last year, that maybe we've learned some lessons from last year that we can apply to this new year and live our ways in different kinds of, in a different kind of manner. So when you talk about resolutions, the question might be asked, <clears throat> well, what exactly is a resolution? Well, Webster's Dictionary defines a resolution as a firm decision. It's a strong commitment for a course of action. That's what a resolution is. And we make those kinds of things all the time, but here's what we do know about resolutions. Resolutions take a lot of work. Resolutions have, take a lot of, of effort. And they take a lot of determination and a willingness to sacrifice whatever it might be to help us reach that firm conviction or that point of action that we want to get to. <clears throat> so I was thinking about a, I read about a, a, a principal who had asked his teachers to give New Year's resolutions. And so they all did. And then he posted them on the bulletin board out in the hallway. And after a week or so, he posted those things there, and all the teachers were gathered around looking at each other's resolutions. And there's a lot of happy banner and a lot of excitement was there. They're talking about different, different ones' um, resolutions. But one of the teachers was throwing a tantrum. She was so upset because she said, where's my resolutions? Why weren't my resolutions put up there? And the principal, he just got this cold feeling inside. And so he rushed away from the group, went into his office and checked his desk to see maybe for some way he had misplaced her resolution. And sure enough, he had. Her resolutions were under some papers. He looked at it. And then he was astounded when he looked at the first resolution. The first resolution was, I resolved not to allow little things this year to bother me. <laughs> here's the idea is that most resolutions are broken within the first month. So I don't know if you are a person that makes resolutions. Maybe you're not one to do so. But if you've made a resolution, a lot of people, they'll make a resolution. And then before a month is out, they've given up on the resolution. And now they are moving on with basically what was their life before the resolution was made. And so I thought to myself, you know, if we're going to make resolutions, here are 10 resolutions we can all keep. Ten resolutions we can all keep. Number one, gain weight. <laughs> We're going to, you can at least gain 10 pounds, 15 pounds, the resolution, gain weight. Here's another one. Stop exercising. Doesn't work anyway. So just stop, stop exercising. Here's another resolution. Stop cooking. Go out to eat more. Read less. Reading just makes you think. So just read less. Get more credit cards. You can always use another credit card. Get more. They're always trying to push those things. So get more credit cards. Here's another one. Break at least one traffic law. You'll probably break a lot of them throughout the year, but at least break one traffic law. Focus on the faults of others. Here's another resolution we can all keep. Sleep in every chance you get. Another resolution. Go on a chocolate diet only. That's a good resolution that we might get all do. Or number 10, never make a New Year's resolution again. Well, obviously, those are all tongue-in-cheek resolutions, right? I mean, other than maybe going on a chocolate diet or, or, or gaining 10 pounds of, of weight. But those are just tongue-in-cheek kind of resolutions. Generally, when we make resolutions, you know, we're fairly serious about those resolutions. But those resolutions usually are of a secular nature. By secular nature, I mean they're, they're really somewhat worldly. Well, they don't have a lot of spiritual value in them. Not that they're not important, but you know, we make resolutions. And so the most popular resolutions are to lose weight. A lot of people make that resolution, you know. Some of us need to make that resolution, but to, to lose weight. Others say, well, I'm going to stop smoking. That's like number two, that people say, you know what, uh, I need to just stop that, that habit or to exercise more, or to spend less time on social media. They'll spend so much time on the various things that are out there surfing the web. Read more, watch less TV, or spend more time with your family. Now, those really are all good resolutions, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with those resolutions that we might make for ourselves because some of them have to do with our, our health and our mentality and, and things like that. But what about spiritual resolutions? 
What about making resolutions that really are going to make a, a spiritual difference in our life and, and a resolution that not only will serve us now in this day, but a resolution that will carry us beyond just the day, into the weeks, the month, into the years, and on down even to the end of our lives? Well, when you talk about a new year, you get a new year with the start of a fresh beginning, right? And so we think about that new year as being that time when we make that resolution, or we make that time when we find that new start or that new beginning. But what I think we need to know as Christians is that, listen, God makes it possible that every day is a new day, no matter what. He allows us to go to bed at night, ending our day, with the forethought of there being a new day in the morning and starting all over again with a fresh slate in a, in a good kind of way. So that's the idea of beginnings. And so this morning I want to talk to you about three things. The first one is this, is a new beginning. <clears throat> now I just read something that surprised me this year. Do you know when most proposals for weddings are made? Well, I thought to myself, well, the, the first proposals for a wedding, when someone asks another person to marry them, it's got to be Valentine's Day. I mean, that, I thought that had to be, that's got to be the one, is Valentine's Day. But it wasn't. So then I thought, well, okay, then it's got to be Christmas. Now, I'm thinking as a man, okay, it's got to be Christmas, where, you know, a man proposes to his intended that he wants to marry her and gives her a bright, shiny ring. What a great way to have a Christmas with a bright, shiny ring. And not only that, as a man, you've accomplished two things. When you gave her a ring, two, you've given her a gift. That's it. That's thinking like a man. But what I was surprised to find out is that most proposals, the vast majority of proposals, are done in the first part of the year or on New Year's Day. That's when most proposals are made. And I think that's good in, in a lot of ways because that tells that person that, listen, I want to begin my life with you. I want you to know that I cherish you and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And that's a way, great way to begin. Now, five years down the line, they might kind of revisit that and see how things are going. But nevertheless, that's a great way to begin. Beginning is good. For instance, beginning a new job. A new job, you take a new job, <clears throat> they don't know anything about you. I mean, they don't know what your values are. They don't know what your idiosyncrasies are. They don't know what your weaknesses are. They don't know a lot of things about you. So you get this fresh start where you just get to do it all over uh, again, so new beginnings sometimes is really a great thing. So new things give us an opportunity to start over in great ways. So have you ever wondered what it would be like to start over? I think probably all of us at one time or another have considered this idea of, of starting over. For instance, a new start with a clean slate. Anyone like to start that way? You just, you know, this day you get a fresh start. This day you have a clean slate. All the mistakes of the past are gone. You don't have to even ever think about them again. They are, it's a, it's a new start, it's a fresh slate. All the past is gone uh, away. And that is exactly what God wants to give us. God wants to give us a fresh start. And that happens when we enter into a new relationship with him. When we come into a personal relationship with him, God has promised to give us a new start or a fresh start. Now, this passage of scripture that you see behind me is <clears throat> the one that you have seen often. It, it's probably one of my favorite passages of scripture. I only have one other that is my favorite passage, but this is one of them, and that's why I probably use it more so than I, maybe I ought. But I love it because it's a passage that gives such encouragement. And it's a passage that gets must, so much hope. And it's a passage about a fresh start or a new beginning. Listen to what it says. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Who doesn't want that? 
I don't know of anyone who doesn't want that, especially if you're not a Christian and you're looking at your past life, you're not excited about that past life, maybe you're even saddened about the past life and you want a new start, Why would that passage there would just be a great news or good news to, to you, or it certainly was to me when I discovered it. And it's good news to me not only in the past, but it's also good, to me, good news to me for the present, that if I'm in Christ, I'm a new creature, the old things passed away, all things have become new. It's the idea of a new creation. Later on, and we're going to find out that it has to do with a, a new person. So what this is saying is that no matter what you, your past may have, have been, no matter how many times you may have messed up or failed, you have a new beginning. And I don't care what your past is. I don't care how bad your past is or, or was. You've been given that, that new beginning. Listen, all of us have failed. All of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned in, in our lives. And sometimes we think that our sin is worse than any other person's sin. Well, maybe categorically it could be true. But the fact is, is that we all have a conscience. And as a result of that, we all feel it when we fall short. We all feel it when we, when we sin. And so the, the good news is, is that we get that new beginning because of the fact that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he says, if any man is in Christ, if anyone is chosen, if anyone has been adopted as God's child, if anyone has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and our transgressions has been forgiven, if any man is in Christ, the old has passed away. All things have become new. In other words, your slate has been wiped clean. All things passed away, and God doesn't hold your past against you. And I'll show you why here in some minutes in, in the future here. God just wants us to feel good. We, just, we need to remind ourselves that God loves us, that he loves us more than we can even possibly fathom how much he loves and how much he wants us to experience that new start in that new beginning in our life. So to have a new beginning then is to be a new person. And I like the way the New Living Translation puts it, uh, in the way they translate it. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. That is, I mean, that's exciting when you think about that being a possibility for each and every one of us to, to know that we have received Christ and know that we have been made a new person in God's, God's eyes. And the thing is, is that we're allowed to choose. When you become a, a new person, it's not like, it's not like, Clark Clint stepping into a, a phone booth and coming out Superman with superpower. But nevertheless, we do have this power, this power of, of changing into this new person, this ability to do some things. And one of those things is we have the ability to choose. We are free, free moral agents. We're not like the animals who live by instinct. We are people that God has created in his image that are able to choose between good and bad, right and wrong, moral and immoral. We are free to make choices, and those choices change our lives. So we're free to choose whether we are willing or whether we're determined or whether we're willing to make that sacrifice to be the new, ter new person that God has called us to be. So we have a new beginning, and we also have the promise of being this new person. So what does a new person look like? What does this new person look like? Well, the new person, there are some things a new person should strive for or strive to avoid and also to put off. Look at Colossians chapter 3, if you would, please. Colossians chapter 3. And I want you to notice what he says here in verses 5 through 10. If, as you turn there, let me just bring, make you aware of what's going on in verse 1. Paul says to these Colossians, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also receive revealed with him in glory. Now listen to this. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality or sensuality, 
impurity, passions, evil desires, and greed or covetousness, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on this account that the, the wrath of the God has, 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 has come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you have put them all aside, anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practice and put on the new self who is being renewed to the true knowledge uh, and according to the image of one who created him. Notice what he talks about. He says, you have been created differently. You have a new life. And so there are things that maybe you might, might have, you know, in the past got yourself into or maybe are even practicing. And now he's saying, listen, there are some things in this new life that are detrimental to your spiritual health, maybe even your physical health, and you need to avoid them. And so you need to put them off. And so he gives you a list of things for us to put aside, which were common in Paul's day. And I can guarantee you they're common in our day. And Paul says, as new persons, put that away. You have a different identity. You're a new person now. And then he talks about some things that we should strive to attain or things that we should strive to put on. Look at verse 12. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so should you. And beyond all things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Listen, those things can do nothing but strengthen your life and make you have a more favorable countenance to those that you rub shoulders with, those you come in contact with. Think about what would happen if we really did put, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. What if we really were to really bear with one another? I mean, listen, we're sinful sinners. We fall short in so many ways. We, we don't always live up to each other's expectations. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to put on those kinds of characteristics as a new person? So there's the old person that Paul talks about, and then he says there's this new person. And he says it's the old person, your old self, you know who you are, you need to avoid those things, put those things off. And then there's some things you need to put on that's going to be remarkable. And he says, and you don't have to do it alone. You're going to have a power to live that life. Look at verses 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were all, all indeed called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts uh, to, to God, or singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God uh, to the Father. Simply saying, all he's saying here is that, listen, let God rule your hearts. Let God umpire your hearts. In fact, that's what the word means when he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. It's the idea of that of being an umpire or one who rules the heart. Let him rule your heart, he says. Be thankful in, in everything. Get into God's word. Look at what he says. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's something about the Word of God, and so maybe we need to get more into God's Word that we need to listen to when there are men up here uh, preaching, or if you're in ladies' class and they're teaching, or you're in Bible class, that you take every opportunity to, uh, that is available to you to get into God's Word. This morning, Jared had an incredible class as he introduced the book of Thessalonians, and if you missed this morning class, then why not make a resolution that you're going to be here next Sunday morning and start taking other things. He's working hard. He's studying hard on the book itself. We have a young adults class. It's a great class. Make sure that you take part into that. So get into God's word. Encourage one another, Paul says. The writer of Hebrews says, listen, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good works. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves, as some is the custom of some or habit of some, but encouraging one another. 
So the purpose of this is to be together with one another and to encourage one another. You might think to yourself, well, yeah, but you know, this is a kind of a one-way thing going here, Richard. You're talking to us. We're not talking back to you. Not a super lot of encouragement that we can give to one another. But the time before services and the time after services is valuable time spent with one another as you can encourage each other and stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And then Paul says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to the Father uh, through him. And so the new life is one that's lived by God's rules as God rules over our, our hearts. So we've talked about a new beginning and then we talked about a new person and what that person is not to look like and what that person is to look like. Now let's talk about a, a new start. At the beginning of the lesson, I talked about having a new start. A son on New Year's Day calls up his dad and says, Hey, Dad, what did you make as your resolution? And he says, Well, son, he goes, I made it as my resolution that I'm going to resolve to make your mom happy all year long. And he said to his, his mom, he goes, well, mom, what did you make as a resolution? She goes, I made it as a resolution to make sure that your dad keeps his resolution all year long. <laughs> uh, getting new starts is, is so important in, in our, our lives. I want you to think a little bit about yourself now and who you are. You know, whether you are a Christian or not, and especially if you are a Christian I want you to know that just because you became a Christian or were baptized into Christ, it does not mean that you'll never desire to sin again. I mean, those things just don't go away. I'd like to tell you that, when, that 52 years ago, when I became a, a Christian, I promised God that night in my bed that I would never sin again. Okay, well, I was pretty naive and very new at this, okay? But I didn't get very far through the next day before I had some sins going on. Your desire to sin probably will never go away. Now, as we mature in Christ, they should get less. And that thing should get much narrower. But you understand that one sin can separate a person from God. So you're going to have your failures, and you're going to fall short. I mean, that's, that's part of... The life, and so where do we start if that's so? How do we get this new beginning, you know, uh, as people who want to be pleasing to God? Well, I think if you're not a Christian, you need to be born again. That's actually where it's, it's going to start. Over in John, the, uh, the third chapter, in that section of, of Scripture, uh, Jesus has a confrontation with a, a very godly man, by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, he says to him, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is, is spirit. That last part there, that which is born of flesh is flesh. He's talking about being born as a human being. The second one is being born as a child of God being born again. And Jesus said, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. It's a spiritual birth that he is talking about. So exactly what happens uh, does that mean and how does that take place? Well, in Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and three through five, Paul has been talking to them about, you know, the spiritual struggle that's going on. And he's been talking to them about God's grace and then he says to them, shall we sin, now that we're under grace, knowing that we're going to sin, shall we sin so that grace may abound? He said, it should never be that way. I think, I think um, the King James says, heaven forbid. But listen to what he says and answer that in verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death 
in order that as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. What he's talking about is he's talking about starting new. That when we die to ourselves, as Jesus died on the cross, or buried in a watery grave, as Jesus was buried in a tomb, he rose up to the immortal man. We rise up to walk in newness of life. Why? Because sin has been removed from our lives. That thing that has, that has held us captive, that thing that has, has spiritually chained us in terms of sin, has been removed. And that's what Acts 2 and verse 38 says. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, on the very first day when the church began on, on Pentecost, Peter preached an incredible sermon. He preached to them about the gospel of Jesus dying and God raising him from the dead and that they were guilty of the fact that Jesus died on the cross as we all in here are guilty of why Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. And they were pricked in their hearts and they said to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is that at this point is when sin is removed out of our lives. That's what Ananias told Paul the Apostle over in Acts 22 and, and verse 16. And Ananias says, and now what are you waiting for, Paul? You know who Jesus is. You know he is Lord. What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What does a new person experience outside of Christ when they come into Jesus? New life. We become a new person with a new beginning and a new start in life. So if you haven't been obedient to that, Today would be a great way, even though we're seven days into the new year, today would be a great day to make that decision and to be baptized in the Christ for the remission of your, your sins. So if Jesus were to come today, you'd go straight to heaven. Or if you were to die for some terrible reason, you would go to heaven. <clears throat> what if you were a Christian and you fall short in, in, your, in, in sin? And, and well, God has made a way for you to get a new start too. And I'm so happy for that. 1 John 1 and verse 4, in that section of Scripture there, it's an incredible section there. He talks about our joy being made complete by knowing who Jesus Christ is. But look at what it says in verses 5 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But, by the way, I said to you that 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 is one of my favorite passages. Verse 7 is my very favorite passage because it's such a freedom passage for us who walk in this life. Listen to what he says. But if we walk in the light as he himself, that's God, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's between God and myself and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. When we're baptized into Christ, that's what happens. We're cleansed of our sins. It's in the continuing action. A constant washing is going on. That's how this word tenses in the original language. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness continual cleansing of our sins. And then it says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Have you, how many of you have been to the beach? You land lovers in the beach. Man, listen, <clears throat> I can remember as a little boy going to the beach, my first time going to the beach. I remember how frightening it was. That ocean is huge. Those waves are powerful, and it, it has always made that impression on me. Last year, Laura and I were in Carmel, and we're down there walking along the beach. And the surf, I don't know if you've ever been to Carmel, but the surf there, there's riptides and stuff going all over the place, but it, the waves come in in a beautiful kind of a surf. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful, and it washes up on the sand. They got to put there as a barrier to keep the ocean back. 
And anyway, the, the waves came in and then they went out and I walked out into the sand, you know. And as I stood there, I kind of did this here and made my footprints in the sand. I'm barefooted so I can see my footprint. And then it comes in and so I run back. And I watch that wave come in and then it rolls back out and it's like my footprint is just barely there. You just kind of barely see an indent where my foot was. And then it rolls back in again. And then it goes back out. And when it goes out that time, the footprint is gone. Completely gone. It's like I'd never been there. And that's the way it is with sin. And that's the power of the blood for a new person. We sin, yes, and we leave our impressions, but God's Son, God, the blood of God's Son cleanses us of all those sins, and they're completely wiped away with a complete new beginning. That's why I like that passage. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new person. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I look at that passage and I say to myself, that passage was written for me. I needed that passage. And then the one that Jeremiah wrote, in Jeremiah 29 verse 10, for I know the plans I have for you. This is God speaking. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to do you harm. Plans to give you a hope in the future, that passage of Scripture has always been a passage of encouragement and grave hope. A time for a new start. A new beginning. 